Okay, I think we're ready, ready to go. Welcome everybody to the uh, Journal of Gemology webinar. Um, my name is Alan, I'm the CEO of GMA and I'm joined by Brendan Laws, Laws who's Editor-in-Chief of the Journal. Uh, just a quick recap, uh, as you know the Journal was first released in 1947. Uh, it was recognised and is recognised as a leader in its field and it publishes original research in um, articles on gemology, natural stones, treatment, synthetics, simulated materials, notes, what's new, conferences, um, and what is going on in the gemological community as a whole, including new media and the literature. Uh, what's great now about the journal, of course, is that it's now included in the Science Citation Index Expanded, that's SCIE. So that's a peer-reviewed journal and it joins 9,200 other journals uh, across 178 disciplines. Um, and it just shows the importance of gemology and the importance of the gemology journal itself and the hard work that Brendan's put in to get it to where it is today and, it, and it's standing. And also it's published in collaboration with the SSCF, uh, the Swiss Gemological Association, uh, sorry, laboratory, and of course support from AGL, which is the American Gem Laboratories. And the journal can be found on our website, but we'll come to that at the end. And so today we're looking at the new one. It should arrive in your doors. So I know there's been a, a bit of a delay in some of these issues getting around the world because of the various COVID regulations. And of course, Brexit hasn't helped in some respect due to customs regulations as well. But I hope you have your copy and you've had a chance to look through it. But today we're going to give a summary of uh, the, some of the key articles and then some of the gem notes. So. Um, over to you, Brendan. Shall we go to the first slide on the first article? Sure, sounds good. Yeah, as you see, first of all, our cover is featuring a beautiful image of coral, but we'll get to that in a minute. First of all, we're going to talk about um, the lead article in this issue is on the Book of Hours um, of King Francis I of France. Um, this is a historic uh, manuscript which is enclosed within a beautiful cover. Uh, it's gold embossed with various gems and um, the authors did a wonderful study at the Louvre Museum in Paris on this particular object which was recently acquired by the museum. Yeah most amazing when you look at the article it, it was a crowdfunded uh, purchase and this this book went to the Louvre after they crowdfunded it went from auction obviously eight million eight hundred and ninety thousand pounds which you know we discussed it's incredible for a crowd crowdfunded uh, article and it and it shows the power of the of the Louvre itself really to uh, bring this back this renaissance fantastic book back into the into the French uh, and it's, an, it's an incredible demonstration too of the price that a book can command of course it's not just the book and the pages itself but it's also the cover that's uh, embossed with these various gem materials um, that's accounting for that that cost so what the authors did is they visited the Louvre uh, briefly for a, a short period of time with portable instruments. And in the next slide, you can see um, a little bit more about what they did. This is, uh, they brought a refractometer. Here you can see they're actually taking the refractive index of the stone on the clasp. And then on yeah. the right side is a portable Raman unit they used. They actually brought two portable Ramans with different lasers that they could use to analyze the different varieties of stones uh, that were present in this in this illuminated manuscript so um what you're mainly seeing is there is there is a large intaglio of carnelian which is the red stone that you can see illuminated there so nicely and then um, in the next slide you'll see there's some uv uh, long wave uv fluorescence image showing that all the red stones you see are rubies that are fluorescing mm -hmm. and then the blue stones are blue and green are turquoise so the uh, the book is inlaid with turquoise rubies and carnelian. I think what's interesting, Brendan, is that it was just the, the using portable instruments, you know, gemologically, because there there will be huge handling restrictions on an object like this. So you know, you don't want to you want to minimize contact and minimize any destructive sampling, even if you're you know accidentally scratch the stone or, or stone or the book itself. Mm -hmm. Well, you can do a lot with with these instruments too. And one yeah. thing you can see here, just with with straightforward UV fluorescence. If you look on the right side, um, that's the, a picture of the, the back of the, or actually the front of the book. And in the kind of the upper left corner, there's a little um, triangular shaped, kind of a blue green area of fluorescence. And that's actually showing, yeah, right there. And that's showing where 
the carnelian, is, carnelian was actually replaced where it cracked and they filled that little area with pink resin to try to match it. And wow. uh, in normal lighting, it's very difficult to see, but here it shows up beautifully in the long wave UV image. Yeah. And you know, the, the book has an excellent provenance. It goes right back to the 1500s, doesn't it? And, and uh, I like some of the history they put together because and compared it with other similar articles of its time. Mm -hmm. um, the, the note I had was that it was once owned by a guy called Richard Mead, who was introduced to the Royal Institution by Sir Isaac Newton. And this mm -hmm. Richard Mead was also a physician to our King, King of England, King George II. So it's got yeah. brilliant historical provenance. And I like the way the, the, the authors have matched that historical provenance with tried to get the stones provenance to match where the stones were coming from at the time, because of course they were quite a limited geographical range of this material for the few deposits that were known along the Silk Road, essentially. Right, right. And and not all the stones are original either. And this is a, an example here of the garnet that's uh, in the clasp of the book where it, it closes the pages together. This stone was has been called all sorts of things through the past. And it's possible, as you see there on the table on the right, in 1539, it was originally described as a ruby um it's interesting to think that maybe this was originally a ruby just like the other red stones in the book but then later mm. on it could have been replaced by a garnet or some other stone and what really tips you off here are two things is first of all it's faceted whereas all the other stones on the book are consisting of polished pieces of rough or cabochons um, which is consistent with the polishing techniques for colored stones available at that time um, but this stone here is, is sharply faceted, and in addition, it's set with a bezel setting, which is much different than the prong setting of the, the rest of the, um, yeah, the stones in the book. So uh, there's strong evidence to show that this was replaced later, and it is indeed a rotolite garnet, as the authors have confirmed, but for the past few decades, it's actually been called a tourmaline, and nobody knows exactly how that started or why, although it does resemble somewhat a tourmaline in both color and inclusions as it turns out it, it is a pyrophalmidine garnet yeah they made they made some assumptions in the article about the the, the the facet top facet is slightly domed right so when you know put it put it on the refractometer they noticed this and so it could have given rise to an anomalous double refraction of course because garnet mm -hmm. is isotropic so mm -hmm. if, if they were they, if there was some sort of anomalous double refraction they might have based that on the color Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't do an analysis, and I think in at the time around, the, um, I think the parlor mines were coming on. The ruby lights from there were very popular in Chinese China as well, weren't they, for carvings and things like that? Yeah, in the late 1800s, they kind of came online. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this might be a bit early because I think you know his first mention of garnet is slightly later, isn't it? I think yeah, 18 uh, oh, 1940s. So yeah. interesting. Well, this is incredible that they got it right got it wrong and then they got it right unless as you say it was once a ruby and yeah. it's been out before 1700 yeah yeah so that's one of the one of the biggest findings of this um, of this study but it's a great it's a great piece yeah yeah so um, next up we have our, uh, our cover story and here we're talking about the identification of precious coral species using trace elements. And um, this is a, a really nice study that built upon um, previous research done by the same authors on a large sample suite of rough material that they analyzed with laser ICPMS. Mm. And then um, what they did for this particular study is they extended that to gemology by looking at some cabochon samples, which were all polished. So there was no evidence of any of the internal structures you can sometimes use to identify coral species. And what's important here um, is the fact that Coralium rubrum is the species of coral found in the Mediterranean, and that can be freely traded, whereas Coralium japonicum is the Pacific Ocean species, mostly harvested off Taiwan and Japan. And mm. that particular variety is covered under CITES, Appendix C, so it cannot be freely traded without going through a lot of documentation, and et cetera. So the idea of how to identify these two species and separate them is, is based in part on um, you know, being able to enforce the CITES rules. So what we'll see what the authors did here, um, 
on the next slide, you can have a look at the, the samples they analyze. <clears throat> Those are the cabochons. So that's the front and back. There are three cabochons. And um, what's shown here is the Japonicum Pacific uh, ocean species on top. And then the two on the bottom are rubrum. And the rubrums are different here because the one in the center was um, harvested from a present day uh, colony from living material, whereas the cabochon on the bottom is um, called um, shiaka coral. And this is actually um, interesting. It's, it's de redeposited coral, like a secondary deposit in the, in the Sicily Channel from the long history of tectonism and volcanism and earthquakes, you know, all sorts of, of traumatic events that have happened there geologically caused some of these coral beds to be um, uprooted and then maybe during landslides or something redeposited on the ocean bottom as these ancient sediments that they can then go and, and retrieve and use for um, the coral industry as well. So um, the corals that form, all of these actually have completely overlapping colors. Um, they, they can range from nearly white all the way through orange and red. So the colors you see here don't happen to be representative necessarily of the different samples, but just show the particular samples they analyze. And what's interesting also is and powerful about this technique is that regardless of the color zones that they analyze, they had the same results in the trace elements that were diagnostic for determining species. So it's a pretty powerful technique. And they were specifically looking at barium and lead, weren't they, within the, yeah. within, within the coral yeah. those, like those growth most, as well? Yeah, those are the most important ones for determining origin. So what's happening um, on the diagram on the right, that's the trace element data. On the lower hand, lower right hand corner, there's a little circle, what they call a circle of correlation. Mm. And it's hard to read on the screen here, but barium and lead are kind of together in that. And then sodium and magnesium are also together and sort of pointing a different way. And what's happening here is the barium and lead are following each other geochemically because they vary depending on the environment or the ocean, the oceanic conditions. So because these came from two completely different oceans, different areas of the Earth's oceans, they um, have different trace element contents. The sodium and magnesium, meanwhile, also show systematic variations together, but they're a result of growth uh, variations. So for faster and slower growth, you get variations in sodium and magnesium. And as a result, those variations would be expected to be shown in coral regardless of locality. And so it's the barium and the lead that were most important. So um, the authors were able to tease out these these correlations by using what's called principal component analysis, which is a trace element processing technique using statistical um, computer algorithms that um, do correlations in, in, in trace elements like we talked about in our last webinar um, regarding the Emerald study that SSEF did to do origin yeah. determination. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a great paper, actually, isn't it? Because, you know, they're doing chemical fingerprinting, aren't they, really, of the corals themselves? I suppose they could separate CITES species from non CITES mm -hmm. and CITES, mm -hmm. um, the sort of control methods, and, uh, and the composition of seawater gives you a sort of provenance from, e from each area. It's, mm -hmm. it's, that's, that's a huge impact, isn't it, for things like environmental science as well? Right, uh, right. But a few different things. Right, and there's there could also be further studies done on different species to see how well these apply, these characteristics apply, and you would expect that there are actually different varieties of, of the coralline species in the Pacific Ocean that all of those would have the same trends. And the authors did do kind of a reconnaissance uh, study on those, and that's, that's what it seems to indicate so far, but we need to have some more data before we can be sure. So this is a technique that could actually be used by GEM Labs um, in determining um, the, the provenance of, or the species of these corals. And, you could do it a couple of different ways. One is by simply doing a straightforward analysis of barium versus um, lead. And um, the authors have presented a table showing the sort of ranges. And then the other way you could do it is to actually do the further application of like the, the principal component analysis. Uh, but in order to do that, you would have to sort of use the same techniques the authors did and um, get a, uh, some more information on, on the actual software that they use, which is, it's all listed in the article. Yeah. So, um, yeah, powerful stuff. Yeah, yeah, congratulations to the authors. Really good, really good article. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So moving on, uh, the next article, an interesting material here. Um, everybody's probably heard of amylite before. You know, this is the iridescent ammonite material from Canada, from Alberta. And um, now we have a, a second locality in Russia that's producing similar material. Uh, just recently was discovered uh, in the last past few years. Hmm. Not a lot of material has been produced yet, but as you can see, it's beautiful stuff. Yeah, so it's we'll, pretty. Gonna... It's pretty amazing, but it's got a it's got it's got a little bit of a twist to it, isn't it? Which we'll 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 come on to yeah. Uh, later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, let's have a look. The next slide gives you an idea of how these things are found because it is quite yeah, remote. Yeah. It's found in the Nurilsk, isn't it? Which is northern Siberia, um, yeah. and and it, and these these ammonites actually yeah. occur in, a, in not in situ but in a glacial deposit. So they're, they're really going to need these tills and glacial deposits where you dig into them and you'll find these large calcareous concretions when sometimes they contain these beautiful form ammonites. Now, I did read in the article that they think they the actual deposit of them is some 200 metres lower in, in the ground in, in the same area. So they're pretty hard to, to extract. Yeah, um, they're not going to be, it's not going to be like Canada where you can go into the actual formation in situ yeah, and, and pull yeah. out the concretions or the, or the ammonites. In this case, because they've been glacially redistributed, they could be anywhere in this area. So they've identified a couple of river drainages where, that tend to have more of these. And uh, you can go in there in the summertime only because this area is, you know, very remote. And of course, in the wintertime is covered with snow. And um, you look for these for these concretions and only one out of every few of these or so many concretions has fossils inside and a lot of times the fossils may not even be what you're looking for but there in this case this one actually contained one of these ammonites the species um, hasn't exactly been determined but the genus this plaque placenteris genus is the same genus that produces the amylite from canada and interestingly yeah. the amylite from canada is also late cretaceous age although it's still about 15 million years younger, the, the one in Canada, than this one, which is approximately 90 million years old. Yeah, yeah. So they, these are Turonian, Tyron, aren't they? So they're about 94, 90 million years years old. For, mm -hmm. for our UK people who are watching, that's equivalent to our middle chalk. So when you look at the south of England, that's about, that's about the same age, to give us this all relative. Um, but yeah, I think I think they're they, they're pretty amazing. They're sort of aragonite, aren't they? But we'll come on to that because the thing about ammonites is they're really important. That they're they're, they're they're index fossils, really. They're biostratigraphic, so based on their morphology, it it it, it it's really was used for the to build the timeline that we know today, the, ge the geological time scale. Exactly. For, for the last few hundred, few million years, anyway, because before that they were totally different. Yeah, yeah. So these things were around when the dinosaurs were around. And in fact, some of these fossils they found have indentations on them and scratch marks that they think were made by the teeth of large, you know, animals that lived in the seas with them that were eating them. Yeah, ichthyosaurs and things like that. Fossil right. mammal reptiles, isn't it? Yeah, eating yeah. these things. Incredible yeah. indentations, yeah. I think. So um, as you see, when, they, when you find them, you have this sort of white coating on the outside. And that's actually the layer that produces the iridescent colors. But when you find them, most of the time, you don't see the, the iridescence because in order to bring that out, they need to be impregnated with epoxy. And in doing so, what that does is it fills in some of the interstitial spaces that occurred during the diagenesis of the material, which means when it was buried, there were some changes that occurred physically and chemically in the, in the material that altered it. And um, when you fill in the pore spaces that were created by that, then that allows the light to penetrate in such a way that it can be refracted and form the iridescence that we see in the, the beautiful jewelry quality material. So on the next slide, we'll see uh, some samples, the, the color range. Most of the material actually is more of this, the sort of red to yellow color um, appearance, but some of it actually does appear blue and green just in its normal state. These samples are showing an interesting phenomenon which, which actually isn't shown by the material from Canada where when you look at the material from different angles, the color appears to change. So the iridescent color. So normally when you look at it, it's that, again, that orangey reddy color. And then if you just sort of move your perspective down so you're looking a little bit more diagonally at the samples, 
then you see all of a sudden they shift to more of a green and blue type color. So pretty neat stuff. These actually are doublets you're seeing here. So commonly what they do is they impregnate the material with resin and then they put a quartz cap on it, make a doublet because the neck or thickness is rather small, rather narrow. And this way you get um, a, a nice protective durable layer over that to, to keep it from being scratched or chipped off. And it also helps bring that, that appearance out a little bit more. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of quite, I'm not shocked, but you always, you always make your eyebrows raise when they, you know, they, they put epoxy resin in there under vacuum, don't they? To mm. fill those pore spaces to increase the, the iridescence. And of course, those, the actual white shell part is actually really thin, isn't it? Right. So right. you normally do get red color and it's quite rare you get the violets or things like that, you know, especially when you're looking face up. Yeah, they do. They do actually impregnate some of the Canadian material as well with yeah. the epoxy. But um, in this case, uh, all of it pretty much needs to be impregnated for it to show the coloration. Um, but neat stuff. They've gotten large, almost whole fossils out. Most of it comes out in pieces that are beautiful for museums as well to display these these beautiful iridescent fossils. And uh, but we're probably not going to see a lot of it entering the gem trade just because of the remoteness of the locality and also how difficult it is to find the pieces in the glacial sediments and then to get in there and extract them right. from these hard sandstone concretions to be able to get them out um, in one piece is, is really difficult, so. Yeah, yeah. And you know, yeah. when you read the article, they explained that the geology of that area was only really looked at in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Quite incredible, really. So they're there, you know, and I suppose you can only go there in the, summer months because it is yeah. so far north it's just it's covered with ice or well, you know winter sets in so yeah, yeah. interesting to see how this one pans out but they're, they're, good, they're good things yeah yeah good okay well so our next article <laughs> an interesting tourmaline so here Alan, i'll yeah. let you introduce this one and you can talk about uh an interesting similarity that you shot that you saw no yeah well I've, I've, I've read the article and i was looking at it thinking i've seen this before and then i remember a few issues ago there was a another article in the journal of a serendipite from sri lanka which i just i just uh, put down below there the, the similar picture and i had to sort of convince myself that it wasn't the same piece and it's not but it just it just you know just as you as you like many of us as you read things things stick in your mind and then it's like i've seen this before now it's changed so that was just my little ditty on that and and even more so more more uncanny with this resemblance is the fact that the serendipite was also written by the same authors so yeah that's right. yeah yeah <laughs> quite an interesting coincidence but uh both materials show this incredibly strong pleochroism and um, what, what happened is the authors did a little field uh, excursion to Sri Lanka. We're studying the gem deposits in the Alahara district of Sri Lanka, which has been mined for, for many, many years. It's been for decades, actually, on a, on a more or less continuous basis. And then they, they, they were presented with one blue pebble, which you see here, which they thought looked a little strange. They didn't know what, for sure what it was. And they purchased it and brought it back. And it turned out to be dravite tourmaline. And this is the first time that we've seen dravite tourmaline in a, in a attractive blue color. So that's the, the interesting thing about this article. And um, in the next slide, you'll see that the authors did some good work characterizing this in detail, um, starting from the mining area, um, some pictures they took when they were there. Also, I, like, I quite like the, the discovery side of things, Brenda. I really like this part because, you know, it, it, the, most of the Sri Lankan mines, they shore up with, with like, the, the sediments are really, right. fragile, aren't they? They put planks really high, but these one, this deposit is quite consolidated, so they're able to, like, dig down and it holds itself together, which is quite interesting. In this, in this case, yeah, it's alluvial, meaning that it's weathered in place rather than being alluvial, uh, yeah. as being redeposited um, in running water, like in streams. And the, the whole deposit area, which is that orange band you see in the map on the left, follows uh, a couple of different river systems. Um, mm. But even though it's along the river, they're actually weathered in place, and that allowed them to mine down in these pits without a lot of um, support, like you were saying. So yeah, they pull yeah. the sediments out, and then they, they use the traditional wicker baskets to pan out the, the heavy material, which is where the gemstones mm. are or they place um, the sediments in one of these jigs, which is an automated sort of a sluice box that um, separates the heavies out. And at the end of the day, they can pick out all the gem materials. 
So um, the next slide shows the some of the work that the authors did on the Ramon spectroscopy. This was, um, they, they determined it was Dravite through um, really some detailed chemical work. But the, initially what they did when they did the Ramon spectroscopy, they were able to see that this was interesting because um, most, nearly all gem tourmaline is considered, it's lithium tourmaline. So elvaite or liticotite, for example, are examples of lit lithium tourmaline that commonly form uh, as gem material. Whereas in this case, the Raman spectrum right off showed that it was not lithium tourmaline. And that's because it was a dravite. Dravites don't have any lithium in them at all. And um, when they did the, the laser ICP analysis, they found only a few, a, a few tenths of a part per million of lithium. So um, they knew right off, even though Raman spectroscopy can't exactly determine the different tourmaline species, it can tell you if it's lithium bearing or not. And so based on that, they did uh, more work because if, let's face it, if it would have been regular elbite tourmaline, then great, we've got, we got a blue tourmaline from Sri Lanka, you know, next. But in this case, uh, the fact that it was Dravite made it much more scientifically interesting. And so um, the, the authors also did some nice uh, origin of color work and determined based on the UV vis spectra that the main origin of color is iron two plus, which is also the same cause of the nice attractive blue color in elbaite tourmaline. Elbaite, um, yeah. And then in, a, in addition, you have that really strong clear charism and that's kicked up by some iron two plus, iron three plus intervalence charge transfer that that helps with that, um, that clear charism. So you actually have eye visible clear charism. You can just take the stone and look at it, you, even without a polarizer of any type. And you can see as you, as you look at it in different angles, the clear quick, uh, near colorless to bright blue color. And you can actually see that in the next slide. Um, they, after they did the work on the rough, they faceted the stone. And Incredible. here's uh, just an example of the same stone look, looking in two different orientations to see the clear quick coloration. Yeah, for those of you who have the article, it's interesting reading it in further detail because um, and they, they go about, they talk about the structure of tool in itself, don't they? Mm -hmm. Some of those chromophores are in certain sites, and and, and they're, they're they're orientated along the c-axis. Mm -hmm. And so that I noticed that the W site, which is quite a, quite an interesting site, just contains OH, and mm -hmm. that's why when you, when you turn it, there is no literally no absorption, so it goes colourless. But you look along those occupied sites with the iron, and there's no titanium in this thing, so you don't get the FeTi transfer from lithium albaites with the indicolites there. So it's a really interesting uh, specimen as well with it, as you say. Well, yeah, that's that's the reason why actually um, the titanium is the reason why that dravite is usually yellow to brown. Most people, yeah. when, they, when they think of dravite tourmaline, you think of what's called like savanna tourmaline, for example, mm. and um, typically from East Africa. And it's usually a, a yellow to brown color. It's It can be attractive when it's in lighter shades. But in this case, we've got this nice blue stone. And the, and the reason is that when it formed, for whatever reason that occurred, there was very little titanium. So without the titanium, then to link up with that iron and make that charge transfer, the iron two plus was free to come through and make the blue coloration. So it's a, it's a neat story. And I, I always believe these things. Now, once one of these things is found and occurs, then people may look more carefully at other things they have that might be blue and lights, and they might suddenly turn to be dravites. So this, this could have a, a knock-on effect in the right. future. Right, and if you're really lucky, it might cause you to, to find a serendivite <laughs> because... That's the dream, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot more rare, and it's very similar in appearance, as we've seen. So. But, you know, one thing I always get from these things, I look at the mining pictures, and I see how much they've taken out of the ground and the, the, the labour they've spent sieving this stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they find this one, you know, nine point, nine point, what was it, nine millimeters, just under a centimetre. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Incredible. But, you know, there's always a great thing will turn up. Yeah, even after this many years. I mean, who knows how much of this has been found in the past and just not even really looked at. But um, the fact that we still have interesting things coming out of these very historic deposits is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. So, so we we'll went to the next article by the author. Yeah. See if it's another uh, a, a, a colorless blue stone to make it a hat trick. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this, is, this is. I, I really enjoyed this. Article. Yeah. It's, it, this is a this is a neat article because you would think by now that 
hardness testing has been, you know, really exhaustively done on stones. Uh, but in this case, what the authors were looking at was the ornamental stones and, and also some single single mineral gem materials like quartz, comparing the hardness when you grind the material, um, which has implications for, for wear, it has implications for the luster of the material once it's been polished. And of course, for industrial uses, it has huge implications uh, when you're looking at, at using some of these stones industrially. So um, in this case, what you'll see is a, a, a small portion of the sample set that the authors use. They took each, gem, each ornamental gem material and they made six blocks out of it. And each block was two centimeters on a side, these cubes. And then they glued these blocks to a glass piece of glass. And then they put that, that round piece of glass with the, with the blocks glued to it into a grinding machine. And they ground um, all the blocks at the same time so that they could get an average of how much material was lost based on grinding the material for a specific amount of time with a specific amount of pressure pushing down on the blocks. And um, this just shows a few examples like um, Jasper and Heliotrope, for example, which is the green on the upper right. There's um, uh, lapis lazuli and then, and then smoky quartz shown sort of in the bottom was oh, what man. they used to compare the grinding hardness to. So they, they made, they arbitrarily set that uh, with a grinding hardness of 100. And then relative to that, they assigned grinding hardnesses to all the other ornamental stones that they tested. So um, in the next slide, we'll see a little bit about how they did this. Or, oh, first of all, yeah, we, this is a nice illustration of the importance of um, not only hardness, but toughness on um, gem materials. Hmm. And here you'll see where on a diamond on the left, even diamonds people think of, of course, it's the hardest gemstone that we deal with, but it also can be brittle when uh, it's impacted in certain directions. And so what you're seeing here are wear marks along facet junctions. And then mm. on the right-hand side, another very hard stone, sapphire, you can see is extensively worn along the facet junctions from, from being worn in a ring for many, many years or decades. Mm. So um, in the next slide now, we'll get into how they tested the grinding hardness, which is a combination then of Mohs, you know, hardness of the mineral with the toughness uh, that's created by the texture of the stones. And so the instrument you see here on the right is, is a, a lapping and polishing machine that was used um, to, test the, to test the grinding hardness. And what we've got is a short video here that shows how they did this. And I should point out that um, on, the, on the video side there on the left, you'll see there's a slide, one of the glass slides with the six pieces of rhodonite in this case that have been mounted on the slide. They take these pieces then and place them face down into, um, there's two different chambers there that have lead weights on top of them that weigh four yeah. kilos each. And then they turn the machine on and you'll see here in the video how the machine rotates around and it's it's being charged by a silicon carbide um, grinding material. So it, there it's spinning around. That, that drum at the top contains the grinding medium, which is being fed onto the, the abrasive wheel there. And then um, each one of the, the chambers there that contains that glass slide is rotating uh, slowly so that it's getting an even exposure to the, um, the material that's grinding it on the lap. So those are the two. So you can see they're rotating. That's what has the, the samples inside. And then that third cylinder in the back is a, a unit that actually makes sure that it stays completely flat while yeah. it's being um, ground in the process. So uh, actually pretty high-tech equipment here that they used to make these measurements and uh, they got some excellent data as a result. So on the next they slide... They were totally consistent, weren't they, Brendan? Like 50 rotations a minute, 30 yeah. minutes, and, and, the, yeah, and then they could measure the, the how much actual material by weighing it, how much has come off. Right, yeah. they would detach, detach those samples from the glass slide and then weigh them and then they could uh, set up a, a simple equation to determine how much was lost and then based on that um, they could relate it to the grinding hardness. Hardness, yeah. So in the next slide they've actually arranged all of the pieces but according to yeah, grinding okay. hardness with the hardest one on the upper left and the softest one in the lower right and there were some interesting surprises here. 
So, yeah, well, when Cal said me it's number one. It was like, wow, you know, supremely polycrystalline, small, small grain size. You know, okay, it's hardness is what seven, some it's quartz, but yeah, it's the, yeah. the interlocking nature of the the things that make it much bigger and grinding hardness, isn't it? Absolutely. So, so right below it, you'll see smoky quartz, which is kind of that that the control, as I was mentioning, or the that's yeah. a grinding hardness of a hundred. Chalcedony, by contrast, 174. And then chrysoprase right next to it, which is a variety of chalcedony colored by nickel, that's 172. So again, you can see the, the consistency here. And when you have this interlocking fabrics, the authors actually cut thin sections of each of these materials and did a detailed petrographic study showing how the, the mineral grains were, were locked together. And I think many people probably have heard how jadeite, for example, is is quite hard especially nephrite and the authors found that here too nephrite block is on the upper right uh, with a grinding harness of 103 which is quite interesting because nephrite is much softer nephrite is made of amphibole which is much softer than quartz um i think it's six 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 point five or something versus quartz of a seven and yet it's got a higher grinding hardness um and due again to the to the texture of these things and then the softness being the softest material being rhodochrosite, which is not too surprising considering that it's made of uh, a material mostly which has a hardness of three. So, you know. Yeah, and they, all those carbonates at the bottom have good cleavages, don't they, as well? So they tend they tend to fracture. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and one of the questions that came up during the review of this article was whether you have the possibility of harder grains within softer grains that could be plucked out, for example. Um, right. And therefore, therefore, sort of influencing the hardness measurements in a way that wasn't consistent. But the authors actually mentioned that when you look at all the surfaces after they've been polished with this grinding, <laughs> they're all perfectly smooth and they don't show any evidence of plucking. Okay. So the um, material, the machine that they used was was quite effective in making a nice even grind and with eliminating with, with eliminating any possibility of plucking out of this material. So. This is really, it's an interesting reconnaissance study. There's still more work to be done because some of these gem materials are, are highly foliated. And so as a result, you might expect different grinding hardnesses in different directions, depending on how it's oriented, according to the foliation lines. And uh, that's an area that the authors say you could, you, know, you could do more research on, but for now they wanted to just get this out there in the literature. And it was very nice of them. They actually donated a whole sample set like you see here to Gem A after the results. So we have a very nicely documented. Yeah, we have them uh, in the office. We were looking at them the other day. That's amazing to, to actually, you know, donate and see the material for all the information uh, mm -hmm. for our students to look at and of course as a, as a reference for the publication itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a really nice, nice circular thank that you, came thank around. Thank you to Henry and his team for doing that. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, that was thanks to Henry Hanny. So. Okay, great. Well, should we uh, move on to some gem right, notes? Yeah. Move on to the, uh, the some of the we, just, we selected, I think, three gem notes, didn't we, this time to just quickly go through uh, this uh, V-shaped quartz. Very strange. This is really unusual quartz. So this has been around for a few years now, but um, this, there's kind of a kicker with this particular sample. What we're seeing here is a single quartz crystal that has been partially cut into slabs and so the base of the crystal is shown at the left, and then and then you'll see there's a sharp sort of you know demarcation there where the termination area of that quartz crystal has been cut off, and, and there's two slabs to the right of that, followed by a cabochon, which corresponded to the very point of the quartz, because this quartz, although it looks ugly from the outside because it's coated with a, another mineral you know coating on there, it okay. shows some very interesting features, and one of which is a trapeche pattern um, in sort of the intermediate zones, and then you get a beautiful red color in towards the termination, and that was the main thing that the authors were interested in studying in this case. The trapeche pattern was actually um, documented previously in, a, in an earlier gem note, and um, we're not actually sure all the minerals that are in there that are causing the pattern, but in this case, uh, you can see a beautiful six-fold spoked pattern trapeche quartz. Mm -hmm. The red color, on the other hand, is, is much more rare in this material. And uh, in this case, the authors made an interesting discovery, as you'll see on the next slide. Well, just, just, to go, uh, just a quick, Brendan, is when you look at these things, right? So it's the only bit, the only the very tip was red, yeah? And I often think back to the actual mode of occurrence of these things. Because, of course, when you get quartz and things growing in, in, in mm -hmm. situ 
rock. You can have closed systems and open systems. So, you know, the crystallization of this thing follows the fluid that it crystallized from. So you could say that, you know, that it might have crystallized and the last remnants of the fluid were iron rich, hence the hematite, so the end exactly. formed last, or there was an influx from an open system of more, more sort of aqueous hydrothermal solution or whatever that contained iron that then formed the crystal. But yeah, just a, this is observation. Yeah, well, this this is a hydrothermal type situation. This this quartz is hosted by a very complex polymetallic vein type deposit right. in China. Right. So it's mined for a variety of ore minerals. And you know, in the late stages of some of these, it's it's not at all uncommon, of course, to have these hydrothermal solutions go through, enriched yeah. in various elements. And in this case, we had a gem note uh, a couple issues ago. It was actually on beautiful pink fluorites from the same deposit area. And in this case, we're talking about these these quartz crystals, so much different part of the deposit. And uh, so hematite, yeah, there's that's that's the kicker. That's what made the red color. But what's mm. unusual about the hematite, as we'll see in the next slide, is the form that it mm. took. And it, it forms these weird whiskers. Um, sometimes they're grouped in these bunches, and um, these have never been documented before in in as an inclusion with this type of a form. Uh, mm -hmm. that we know of. Uh, Emmanuel Fritsch and co-authors were looking at this and they couldn't find any any examples that uh, were similar to this in the past. So something kind of new to science. It's very interesting though, you know, because the fluorites that you just mentioned, they have uh, bisolite or something fibers in there as well that are all curly, curly, curly. Exactly. Yeah. That was a fibrous amphibole in this case. Yeah, in that case. Yeah. And it was um, just made for some interesting inclusion patterns, and but it didn't cause any of the coloration of the materials yeah. the pink fluorite was intrinsically pink whereas here in this quartz the inclusions are responsible for the overall red color of the cabochons yeah but we used you know we used to rutile aren't we and tremolite especially forms things but not mm -hmm. hematite in long curved crystals which is really mm -hmm. strange mm -hmm. yeah it's a first isn't it they also said it was a first emmanuel yeah. that's right that's yeah. right yeah so next one we'll go on to uh this ah. interesting uh, color change androdite. Now, how many people have heard of that before? So that that it's very common to see color shift androdite, where um, you have, for example, some of the set uh, the, uh, the the material like demantoid from Madagascar or Namibia, which can mm. show more of a bluish color in daylight than in incandescent light. But this is completely different. And in fact, this particular stone, uh, three about three carat androdite was set in, a, in an old style ring, which mid-century style, which had probably passed hands many times under the guise that it was Alexandrite. Yeah. And then when it was submitted to um, Carr and Bear Williams lab, they determined that no, it's actually Androdite and it shows this strange color change, which we haven't seen before in, in Androdite. So there's the UV vis spectrum below. And it's it shows all the features consistent with iron. and just like you would see in in like a Namibian uh, color change or Namibian uh, uh, demantoid, but for whatever reason, and, and unfortunately we don't know the cause of the color change in the stone. Um, it's possible there might have been some rare elements that are involved because they did detect uh, by EDXRF the presence of very trace amounts of rare elements, but um, we don't have a, a, a detailed enough trace element pattern to try to differentiate why this stone is so different than typical androdite. It's a strange one, isn't it? Because when, you know, you mentioned Demantua, but you then probably want to look at, see some chromium in there and things like that, wouldn't you really, to have that? So yes, there isn't it's just, any. It's just iron, just like the, the Demantoid you get, you know, from... So they, they call it an androdite, isn't it? Part of the Groschelis series, an androdite itself. Yeah. Yeah. So this, it's a, it's an unusual stone, which we still have more questions than answers for in, in some ways. And I think that, I thought what's really good about um, Car and Bear is I think they mentioned also about, you know, that the color change itself in the past, we've just had a simple incandescent light and then uh, mm -hmm. a, a cold light. But now the lights available on the market, you get, you get so many different types of lamps, halogens, and you get rare earth lamps and things, all these different light sources. So it, they might have an effect on color change itself because of the light source that's going Absolutely. in. Absolutely, especially with the new LED sources, you know. They, yeah, they... so we've made things 
may be difficult for ourselves because you know I, I mean, if you, you don't, we almost have to try every single light to see if the color change is consistent on all those different um, absorption wavelengths of the light itself. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. That's a very important point. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we'll go on to the next note now. Yeah, I think this is a the last. All right. The last note. This is this is a great thing. Yeah. This, this is Julia, this, one of our former tutors, of course. Right, Julia Griffith, former tutor at, at Gem A. Yeah. And she teamed up with uh, Harold Dupuy at Stoller to do the testing on this. So Julia had had uh, noticed that. For, for the past few years that there was some evidence that diamond testers were giving faulty results for certain HPHT grown synthetic diamonds. And uh, rather than detecting them as diamond, they were calling them moissanite. And um, there, it turns out there's a specific reason why this occurred. And it has to do with the electrical conductivity. And um, what's happening is that some of the HPHT grown synthetics have very small traces of boron that uh, are present that were added during the growth uh, episode. And they may be so small, in fact, that the, the, the faint blue color that results from that boron addition may not even be visible when viewed face up. And uh, these were just a few example samples that the, the Stoller group arranged for this testing. And um, so what you see here are three samples on the left shown face up. Um, where boron was detected by IR spectroscopy, and then when you see them on the right side, viewed from the from the uh, side view, there is a slight tinge of blue in the in the two left stones. The one uh, on the right of those is just, you know, really for all practical purposes, still fairly near colorless. And then for comparison, uh, a K-color diamond, which is more, you know, your typical range of very pale yellow uh, shown for comparison that had no boron detected by um, IR spectroscopy. And sure enough, when these were tested by these three different diamond testers, all of them identified the, the synthetic diamonds on the left, the three synthetic diamonds containing boron as synthetic moissanite. Right. And only the, only the one diamond, uh, the synthetic on the far right that had no boron had the um, the diamond proper diamond identification. So, pretty cool, pretty cool research. Um, you know, interesting to think about when you're looking at the fact that synthetic diamonds are becoming so much more common today, mm. and you know, people are buying engagement rings with synthetics. And what if you know you took your ring to get tested, and all of a sudden uh, you were told, "Oh, it's it's moissanite." Well, wait a minute, you know. <laughs> so, it's it's really good to keep this in mind, and to once you you have a moissanite detection with some of these diamond testers, you might want to reconfirm that testing by just doing some simple observations, looking for the doubling of the facet junctions that you'd expect for synthetic moissanite uh, because it's doubly refractive or uh, the different fluorescence characteristics that you'd expect for synthetic diamonds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I, when I think about diamond research in this, this field, it, there's so many combinations of things that can happen i mean in natural stones blue stones you, you're only looking at 0.5 ppm for a, to something like the hope diamond for boron so this must be far less than that then you get to a point where boron's negligible and, and so you know and that's reflected in the color i think they said there's been no there's been no stones but they're going to look at stones that are from the d to the f range which are really low boron mm -hmm. uh, and i think nitrogen might play some sort of role here somewhere because nitrogen doesn't help um, for color for boron stones. It tends to sh uh, mitigate it somewhat. Mm -hmm. I think they sort of mentioned that. Well, but, uh, well yeah, on. I was going to say one thing that's open for further research is where is the cutoff? You know, how how little yeah. of boron, how colorless can they be before you don't have this problem anymore? Yeah. So yeah. So always look for your double refraction and get your UV torch out, isn't it? Still, the, the testers are tall in the armor. But it's these papers like this, these little notes, really interesting to know what what your problems may be, you know. So you you always you need a variety of tools and techniques at your fingertips and knowledge uh, to work through this stuff. This is great, mm -hmm. really good, really good note. Good, yeah. Okay, well, Brent, I think that's yeah, that's it. I, you know, overall, I think it's quite a weighty weighty volume this time. There's a lot of uh, information in there. There's a lot more than we, what we covered today, for sure, and the time we had yeah. available. So. A lot in there. 
we had a hard choice sort of picking didn't we to get within mm -hmm. our hour but i think also that i think uh, i think it's reflected in as you said at the last uh, webinar is that we we seem to be seeing a lot more um good articles and interesting articles and a, a very big range and breadth of articles coming your way now mm -hmm. absolutely so, yeah and it continues to be the case i mean i'm not sure if it's uh a COVID related phenomenon or what, but uh, we've got more articles than, than ever that, that have been submitted for the journal that are in the pipeline and various stages of review. So watch the next few issues for some more really neat stuff coming up. Yeah, yeah. And so for, uh, could you just put last slide up here, how to access the journal. You know, if you become a member uh, of GEMA, um, you'll, be, you'll get your two years access to two years, but we do have a big archive from 1947 to 2018, which is freely accessible. Uh, downloadable on all platforms and it's really very useful um, and now we do end up an updatable searchable index and bibliographies uh, I use it all the time and that's updated annually which is great you don't have to wait 10 years to get your last 10 years index um, and of course there is a big de depository uh, of additional photos uh, the videos that you saw and video clips and data sources and, and, and links to other sources so yeah, great job. I don't think we have any questions uh, on my screen uh, hasn't seemed to appeared. So I presume there won't be any. And, and so of course we do welcome your feedback, just some uh, mailboxes there, events at GMA, education, membership, and of course we do sell instruments for questions about instruments, that's the place to go um, for any questions you may have. So, with that, Brendan, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Great job. And uh, we look forward to the next one. Sounds great, guys. Thank you. Brilliant. And thank you, everyone, for attending. I know there's a big football game on today. You're probably going to rush off to see that. I certainly am. So uh, <laughs> let's hope for a good result. And uh, we'll see you all very soon. All brilliant. right. Signing off. Thank you. Bye.